Hey, welcome back, everyone. We're here live. We've got Fjolnir back for a part two. We've got Adam Dole here participating in this stream. I'm pretty excited to be able to be covering this topic uh, because we started with the settlement era last week, and now we're actually able to move into a bit more of once the island is just starting to get settled. And last week, I had read a weird sort of incorrect, not necessarily incorrect, but like a weird romanticized version about the life of Ingolfer. And now I actually found the actual more direct translation. So I was able to go back and read that and read through, read through everything correctly with a much more accurate, non-romanticized translation. So I'm excited to kind of get into the weeds of this stuff. Um, and then Fjolnir has part two of his whole presentation going through all of this he's worked really hard on it he's been updating it throughout the week getting in some really cool stuff so you're actually able to you know see the locations see where these events took place and it's gonna be a lot of fun uh unfortunately walrus was not able to join us this week he's got some health problems right now uh that kind of flared up at once so if you guys could send a prayer for walrus that he He's feeling better that he's going to do all right. I think he'll be okay, but um, just, uh, yeah, send him a prayer that he recovers from uh, stuff going on right now. And, yeah, we'll be able to get into it. So do you want to introduce yourself a little bit, Fjolnir and Adam? Uh, yes, I, I will be handling the presentation today about Inkul Saga, but other than that, I... My sweet name is Fjölnir, and I'm just an anonymous lore master. Let's just put it at that. So, yeah, and Adam uh, was able to join us last minute, hop on the panel. So Adam's able to provide a little bit of an outsider's perspective, kind of get some get perspective for people who aren't as immersed in the uh, total total nitty-gritty details of Icelandic medieval history. So it'll be fun to have Adam on. Do you want to say hi, Adam? Uh, yeah, uh, I am... I, I'm i not very well educated on this topic, so I, I'll try to be asking questions as they come up. Hopefully they're insightful. And apparently I'm filling in for walrus, so yeah, those are large shoes, so I hope I don't do awful. <laughs> no, it's fun. I think... Part of the fun is bringing in people at different levels of knowledge on this stuff. I consider myself very sort of medium to low level knowledge uh, when I'm, and that's the thing with the channels. When I'm when I'm covering a topic, I try to study kind of broadly, but then there's just so much knowledge to learn that if I if I am going to present on something or make a video, I try to just dive really deep and dig really deep into a very specific subset of it, so I can actually you know say things with a certain level of confidence, but. That's why it's fun to bring on guests, you know, sort of like Joe Rogan. He'll bring on all these people who know way more about a, a niche topic, and that makes it easy for me. Ah, uh, yeah, Nordic Joe Rogan. That's what Matt is. Let's go. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I'll need a little more HGH. I, I, th I think I think Matt is a bit bit less of a crook brain than Joe. <laughs> 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 to be honest. Hey, I love I love the uh, rug brain mode of life. I think that's that's what we need to return to. We'll I'm not di I'm not dissing the rug brain, but you know Matt is unfortunately he doesn't have that mode of being. So, <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Should we? You want to take it away? Well, or not Walrus? You want to <laughs> take it away, Fjolnir? I I wish Walrus were here. Damn it. So okay, if you pop onto the Yes, today, uh, oh, it's only three watching, okay, so hopefully more will come in later. But today we are going to cover uh, the infamous Ingolfur Arnarsson, uh, one of the most, Iceland's most infamous settlers. If you go to the, to the first slide. And he is uh, one of the more legendary settlers here. And... The, our story begins in Norway. Uh, two guys, Björnólfur and Hróaldur. And they were the sons of Hrómundur. 
and lived in Telemark in Norway. Uh, they they were caught in a feud and fled to called Dalsfjörður, Dalsfjörður in Norway. Uh, we can I think I have a I have a picture of both both places in the, in the slides, but we can look it on a map later. Uh, Earth had two children, Ingolur and Helga. Yeah, the son, son of Björnólur was named Örn. It's a bit of a genealogy to start with, you know. Uh, and the son of Hróaldur was Hróðmar. And Hróðmar's son was Leifur. Uh, if you want to ask me the, na the, the meaning of these names, uh, I'm not sure what, you know, Örn means equal. Uh, Björn Olver, it's something related to a bear. Bear um, could be bear wolf or something. I don't know. Uh, Leivur means inherit, inheritor to someone who inherits. And Helga, there's also a male equivalent of that name. Uh, Helgi, it means holy. So. And I'm not exactly sure what Ingolur means. I don't, I can maybe Google it later, but so if we go to the next slide. But they had to flee to, to, yeah, here's a picture of, of their original, the yeah, of their original uh, inhabitation. So, so my, my question is, because it doesn't say specifically in Landnamu's book, uh, were they subject to outlawry? Had they been declared outlaws at this time, or were they no, assuming was... that they would be outlaws? So they said, "All right, let's just get out of here." Just that they were part of a feud and they had to flee. Okay. I think so. Uh, uh, apparently, I, I think so. It's just so. If I can maybe look at the old Norse version here. Uh, yeah, it just said that uh, that they 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 landed in some feud, and and they apparently had to flee. You know, so okay, next hmm. slide. That's, All right. Not go yeah. going to detail. So yeah, it, yeah. I have I have the I have it in Old Norse here in front of me. So so it and with like a bit of a commentary. So. Uh, so, and there's also one thing, um, according to some other manuscripts called uh, a different manuscripts, apparently Ingolur's lineage is described a bit differently. He is called, hmm. which is, which is very interesting. You know, he is called Björnulf Sonur, Björnulfsson. In that manuscript, I think it's a younger manuscript, though, so it could have been a mistranslation. But but I think the manuscripts that we are reading from is more reliable, you know, the, the, this family lineage. So it's just, just something to keep in mind. So yeah, this is this is Dalsfjörður. This is Rivedal, where where they where they lived. So I, I think I think there's a statue of him there. And they they celebrate him in Rivedal. So go to the next slide. Yes, Ingolo and Eivur, they were really close. They grew up together. And uh, it is interesting, this this first brother, this is a special Old Norse concept. This is mentioned in the sarcas many times. Um, it seems to have been some sort of oath, like a like a like a oath of brotherhood, you know. When you swear an oath, you are equivalent to brothers, basically. Hmm. Something like that. You you're sw you're sworn as brothers, you know. In in the in the saga of Gisli Susan outlaw the outlaw, he also swears the takes this oath. And you you're basically family, you know even though you're not blood related. 
seems to be something like that. And they went together on Viking rates, you know, under the employment of, of the, uh, with the sons of, of, of a Jarl named Atli from a, from a town called Gaular, Gaulum. Uh, they went with their sons and they were apparently sponsored by this Atli. Atli is a direct derivative, old, old Norse derivative of the name Attila. Oh, Which that's is, interesting. Yes. Hmm. So, so they had some sort of knowledge from the migration era of Attila that that name had kind of spread. Yes. It would seem, yeah. So that is very interesting. It's also a name in Iceland today. And, you know, he went on Viking raids with the sons of the sons was house state, her state, and home state. The the three sons. Uh, house state, I think, means high rock. Her uh, state means here means uh, like a fighting rock or something. Home state means island rock. So it's a direct translation. So. These are also modern names. Uh, Helga, uh, Ingolu's sister, Homestead was really into her. And, and if you go to the next slide. So, yeah, Helga was, was uh, and Leivu didn't like that at all. So, so, um, so it is said that he, they were at a party, at a, at a house, and uh, if you go to the previous slide, yeah, uh, Homestead, apparently, they, they, he made some proclamation that he was going to get into Helga's pants, so, and that pissed pissed them both off apparently i mean you can just picture him yeah. saying you know i declare that i will be wed to helga the most beautiful woman and then there's just this awkward silence yeah and and, and it is said that it is said that Leivur became his face grew red <laughs> and and with, with with fury and he was like not having this it's like you just said what yeah, yeah, and uh, this was the star. This was the star. You know, he crossed clearly crossed crossed the line there. You know, because because like marriages were arranged at that time, and you couldn't, and they were like also high status guys. So it's he's, u- he's usurping his authority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By making that declaration, it's it's also like a clear disrespect. You know, so yeah, like Helga was was basically it's basically saying that i i'm going to claim your land you know someday you know to claim your wife without your you know without your authority without your consent or something you know just <laughs> yeah just trying to step on the guy's toes more or less <laughs> yeah and this is uh so if you if you next slide so they started the feud, and uh, apparently the the sons of Atli, they attacked Leivur and Ingolur first. They, they ambushed them because, you know, you know they wanted Helga basically, and this there was a battle that ensued back there, and they almost died, and then. They were reinforced by Ingolur and Labour were reinforced by, you know, kinsmen and friends. And they barely won the battle. Holstead was killed and their team, you know, their gang retreated. And this is a this is like a historical, you know, it's more like a skirmish. So if we go to that. So 
uh, after that, you know, it was and already, you know, they said Sparta feud, you know, almost it was that, but they, they continued to rating the Isles, you know, that summer. Uh, and, you know, the, the two brothers, you know, Herstedt, um, they, they had to avenge Homestead. They, they were like bound to avenge him. And they attacked them following winter, and they were obviously expecting the, the attack. And there was another brutal battle that ensued. And Herstedt was killed. So these guys were hmm. obviously good at defending themselves. And, you know, this reached the boiling point where Atli, where, where I think the site of Ingol and Leivur appealed to Atli Jarl, their, their father, to settle this, to put an end to this. And, and, the, and the agreement was they had to give Atli all of their land in Norway. So, so now they had no land and basically no home in Norway. So this was the, was the catalyst that forced them to move elsewhere. So if you go to the next slide. So they started building a ship apparently or made some other guys do it. It just said they the ship Mickey they, they built a ship uh, and they have heard of the exploration of Hrafnafloki they picked up on that rumor and they heard there was a this huge island in the west in the northwest so they might as well settle it because they were homeless so they apparently went straight, you know, it is not described as island hopping, I think. They just went, they said that they went on and, you know, landed in, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the southeast, in a place called Altafjörður. And apparently in a, in a place called Gatehedlur. Which is a there's a farm there today, apparently with the same name. It was destroyed, I think, and it is speculated that this is the same. It was built on top of that, you know, settlement, that, that camp where they where they formed, where they landed. So they explored the country and they liked it. Uh, it is said that they liked the southern quarter better than the northern quarter. Uh, the south was like more fertile, more sunny, and the north of was more harsh and more barren. So they returned then to Norway for because they didn't apparently have enough funding to continue. He was skate -headler. Just like a first trip was an exploratory trip, the second they liked the the the, the country, so they. We're going to move here. Here's gate headlers. This is the area. Uh, next one. Uh, this is Altafjörður. This means uh, the fjord of the swans. Hmm. This is a direct direct translation. Do you? I didn't realize there were swans in Iceland. Is that no. a common sight, or is it just named after that for some other reason? A lot, a lot of them. There are a lot of swans here. Oh, okay. So they're all over the place, yeah. So I suppose, yeah. As far as creatures go that could reach Iceland, you know, you're you're gonna get more avian creatures. You're gonna get birds of all sorts. I mean, we have eagles, falcons, uh, all sorts of birds. You know, it's basically a paradise for birds because they there are so few predators. The prey on there you only have the arctic fox and more recently the mink hmm but the mink came later than yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so like a bird the birds here are thriving 
but the, fo- the, the land fauna, no, no megafauna whatsoever, except for maybe imported reindeer. If we go to the next slide. Uh, so they had to figure out a way to fund this colon- colonization effort. And they decided to, to let the Irish uh, fund, fund their exploits. <laughs> So <laughs> unwillingly, yeah, unwillingly. So I, I, we have to thank the Irish for for funding the the exploration of and and, and the settlement of Iceland, uh, and Labour especially. He, he he rated left and right during the uh, in the in the Isles in, in Ireland, according to the sagas. So he he read it and he found a sword. He it is said that he entered a, a house, a kind of a sort of a turf house, a yard house. Yeah, I think it was basically mean like a some sort of turf house. And it was dark and the only thing lighting the room was a sword. And some dude holding it really scared and he just picked, took it from him and killed him. And found and like a here's a really cool sword that I found, and uh, yeah, kind of a basically you know looting you know. Wait, wait. So, so, so the sagas go out of their way to describe that particular encounter. Yes, and okay, and okay, okay. It's really random, you know, stuff like that, and and then. It's a it's a Skyrim quest basically. Yeah, it's a Sky it's a, oh, Sky, yeah. it's a, it's a, Sky, a Skyrim quest. He found an NPC and and killed him and took his sword. I found a, Have a you legend. heard of the high elves? <laughs> yeah, and, and he takes the sword. He killed a Breton and uh, and took his. Okay, so, <laughs> but we don't know if it was us. It could have been like a, another Scandinavian. We don't know if yeah if because for all the non gamers. Breton is a race in Skyrim in the video game yeah, yeah. Skyrim. We gotta, you know, we gotta be inclusive to our non-gamers here. Yeah, but but we the situation in Ireland was actually a lot more complicated than than we might think because we had we directly ruled the Herbetes and Orkney and a part of Ireland, so. And yeah, apparent, in Dublin becomes yeah, yeah, a Dublin. Viking city during the during the Viking Age, and then at this time Ireland is divided between quite a number of kings, and sometimes you have an over king at different times who manages to kind of pull together all of the mm-hmm. all of the sort of regional kings. But usually, I think it was something like ten kings. It was quite a few that they had at the time. Ireland was very divided, which made it somewhat easy pickings. Uh, these or kings North. were apparently hiring Norwegian mercenaries. So you had Scandinavians maybe fighting on the side of some Irish king against other Irishmen. Mobile gamers don't count nor do none. Yeah. We don't we don't let mobile gamers in. You know, we, like we, yeah, yeah. We we had apparently, you know, we, we apparently had, I, I heard that, you know, the, the situation, you know, they hired, you know, Norwegian mercenaries against other Irish kings. So, so that's, this was basically a, a PVP situation, you know, it was not a, it was not a, a, a war per se between Scandinavians and the Irish. It was a continuing civil war amongst the Irish, and the and the North basically took advantage of it. Yeah, which is the same phenomenon you find in England when England before England was properly England when it was you know Mercia, East Umbria, or not East Umbria, uh, Mercia, uh, Essex, Northumbria, etc. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, so yeah, he he got his name, nickname, Hjör 
is our Iceland, Iceland word for sword. Uh, and because you found this cool sword, it's made to like, we're going to call you Hjörleifur now, because you have this sword, probably as a, as a nickname, you know. It's, a, it's weird how these dudes get these nicknames out of like yeah. random events, you know, it's, it's not it's that. Like, some, like you have one of, one of, uh, one of Ingolf's descendants is, it's something or other flat nosed because he just had kind of a flat nose. So you get these like, do you want to comment a little bit about how these nicknames, like, cause you see them all over the sagas. You have like I, I, uh, Eric Blood Axe, <laughs> which is yeah. maybe the best. I think that's obvious why he. Yeah, yeah. I love that one. It's it's so, I mean, it's something straight out of uh, fantasy, like a, a pulp fantasy novel. It's and you like, also have the nickname become real names. Hjörleifur is an Icelandic name today. It became a real name from this dude. And, and it, reminds also... me of, it reminds me a little bit of like Native American names, how they would have their name and they'd associate it with something. So like uh, Raven Crow, uh, Fast Walker, you know, things like that where you get these hyphenated adjective names yeah but this seems to be from like a particular hero in a particular situation during a particular event there's also another icelandic name uh like ice laver which means just ice laver so it could have been a nickname for some laver that lived in iceland it was the name of the first bishop also so we, we don't know the origin of that name. And I think there are, are like Christ labor also, which means, you know, Christ labor. A lot mm. of, so they, they probably started out as some nicknames and then evolved into actual names. So yeah, uh, if you continue with the story. Yeah, he rated Ireland and he, no, 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 go to the previous Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, like gained a lot of wealth he got loaded basically and he it is only said that he took 10 slaves it's not said that he he uh you know took them from the rating itself it was a hand tók tíu thræla you know it might have been translated as he you know he bought them or acquired the direct is more acquire yeah. 10 slaves and it doesn't name all of them which is interesting it names half of them yes and five of the ha only one of the names is gaelic uh, it's the gaelic version of it the rest are norwegian or nordic so the question is, are the other guys, are they, you know, Norwegians or, or Danes, you know, are they Scandinavians or are they Gaelic also? Well, was it, was it a common thing like at all to like rename slaves to like common, like to, to rename them into like a Norwegian name? Was that a thing that they did at all? I, I don't know. I, there's no mention of that in sagas like renaming they just the slaves seem to have kept their like why was Dufthakur not named for renamed for example but yeah, yeah, yeah. The, other, the other ones if they were renamed then they made a north norse version of the gaelic name which can be easily like traced with comparative linguistics you know Dufthakur does not have a norse origin it is clearly linked to this Gaelic name, but the others are clearly Germanic names. And there are still names today. Skjaldbjörn, for example, means shield bear. Uh, Gerröður, Haldor, you know, these are really normal Scandinavian names. So, like, like Leo described in some live stream, that, you know, slavery in the Viking Age was not like chattel slavery it was it could have been more like endangered servitude so yeah, guy, guys guys in 
that's something they portray a little weird in in the movie The Northman is they they portray slavery as this yeah much more like this sort of chattel slavery yeah um, they're like cha- they're like chaining everyone up and like beating that like they're portraying it like sort of a yeah a very modern conception of slavery I mean even I could tell it was Americanized yeah I yeah I'm I'm not going to rant about that movie it's 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 for for another live stream but uh so. Uh, so I mean, if, if they they settled, they went to Ireland, and I think you know, the the mindset could have been okay. I, I, am I going to use higher, you know, ten guys, ten you know mercenaries or or, or free men, or would it be cheaper to just hire endangered servants, you know, who are in debt, and I will promise them freedom if they, you know, complete this quest. Obviously, he would, you know, that makes sense, you know, if he would raid and take literal slaves by force. And, you know, these guys would betray him, you know, immediately, you know, why, why, why would you fill your crew with slaves that you like people that you, you know, that, that you took the freedom from, you know, it doesn't make that much sense. It's rather like that this is a way for the guys to pay off their debt. And one of yeah. these guys seem to have they're happened. They're interns. To... Yeah, yeah, they're uh, interns. Like a really, really, really awful internship. They they owed the, the Jarl some money, and the Jarl said, you know, or, or they, you know, they, they just, this was their chance to become free men. And you can see later, one one of them, two of them, they become free when they, when they... Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Yeah, 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 so... But anyway, one of them, I think it's obvious that Dufthaker was an Irishman. He was he was a Celt because he had a Gaelic Gaelic name. So so that that's like one, you know. Uh, that's where you go into the to the Gaelic origin of Icelanders, which I said in the previous. I think it's it's complete bullshit. But 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 this is like uh, it is clearly mentioned. You know, this dude is Gaelic, while the other seems not to be. But there's also another excerpt that the man, the, the men are described as Irish. So we exactly don't know. I don't know. You know, they could have been all Irish, or they could have been mostly Scandinavian. We just we just don't know. The sagas are not that clear on it. So if we go to the next slide. So, Hjörleifur married Ingólfur sister Helga uh, because they were so, such a great bros. Ingólfur, Ingólfur gave Hjörleifur, uh, he, he gave him his sister. Which that's, unites that's, them kind of as family yeah. then, so he becomes... He becomes that's the, like a... Uh, yeah, yeah. That's like sign of a great friendship, you know. If you if you allow your friend to get into your sister's pants, that's like a you you must really respect him, you know. I will keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. So they they must have been really good bro- buddies. So yeah, a, a great blow was held by Inkolus. So here we have another ritual before before a journey, before they set sail. And the ritual is not described in any detail whatsoever, just like with the one in Floki saga. It's not that uh, they don't go into the rites, they don't go into how they conducted the ritual, but they do mention a oracle. He consulted the oracle in the ritual and she pointed to Iceland you know, and approved of the journey. It's basically, she, she had a clear, like she said, you know, this journey is approved by the gods or something, something like that. So we get a bit of insight into like a, like a small glimpse into these rituals, but not much. Yeah. And it shows how much they, they took it seriously too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we'll abide by. So he, here is a here is a weird weird thing though. Hjörleifur seems to have he didn't partake. He it is that han 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 blotaði ekki. Han blotaði eigi. He did not conduct any rituals or engage in any sort of worship. So apparently he either he didn't believe in the gods. He was called godless, godless. So like was he was he an atheist or was he just did he acknowledge you know did he you know he believed the god existed but said you know fuck them I just believe in my own strength because there are two other guys mentioned in the sagas I think two father and son that are also said to have been godless or godless. It didn't to be yeah and to be godless doesn't necessarily mean that you're a 20th century materialist it yeah, yeah. can very much mean that you know you you don't choose to honor like well these gods exist but i'm not choosing to like honor honor any of them or make sacrifices because it's it, kind it, of a very modern reading to look back and just assume people thought about things like with the scientific method i um, think I think you know everybody believed the gods existed. My, my take is that they they believed they existed. They just didn't want to please them or or sacrifice to them, stuff like that. Th that's my take because they didn't have this materialistic worldview. None of them did. So they they didn't worship them. They didn't. They just believed in their own strength, and they could do without the protection of the gods. So, yeah, they weren't, you know, 19th or 20th century atheists by, by any means. So they sailed to Iceland in the spring. Uh, apparently, they sailed on separate ships. So th this is one theory. They, they because they colonized different parts of the I Iceland. So I'm, I'm thinking it is said they built one big ship, but they landed on two different areas. So I'm thinking, uh, was it, uh, we have a ship, they, they probably sailed on a, on a ship called, not the long ship, the long ship or, uh, or warships. Uh, they, they used a ship called Knarr. If you can Google that and show a picture of it. No. Knarr. Right. All right, I'll get that photo up here for you all. Hang tight here. Ah, Bjarki is. Hello, Bjarki. All right. Check this out. Look at this ship. Isn't this cool? I love this. It's a miniature of it. Um, yes. So it's really cool. But you so can these, see, I mean, you can see how big it is. It's got like this, it's pretty steep sides. These are like, they can also, they can be bigger. They can be yeah. huge. So the, these are like much broader and, and the long ships are warships. They used to land in fjords. Uh, these are co colonial ships. These are ships used to move cattle and families and livestock and all of your possessions these are used for settlements and they they, pro they most likely definitely used one of these ships so i'm thinking there was most likely a boat uh attached to it and it could have been at ingolver they sailed on one big knarr and when they got near the coast hjörleifur you know detached a boat a smaller boat from the Knarr with his own stuff. Something like that. That that's one possibility. Because ships were, you know, really fucking expensive back then. So Yeah, it's a big deal to have a, have your own ship. That that's my theory. That's my theory. But like I said, I, I have I don't know. I I just, you know articulating what the sarcas say and Give you my takes on it. So if you, well, 
Yeah, I'll pull up some other images here. I'll pull up another tab. You guys can actually get kind of better view what this is. Because sometimes, it, I mean, it helps to actually have an image in your head when you're looking at this stuff. So I'll pull up another one here. How many are watching the stream? Uh, we've got five with us right now. Mm -hmm. So we're vibing. We're vibing here. How and many the nice that? thing is a lot of people, we've been getting great traction after... The streams go yeah. so it's fun to it's fun to see how many were live were live last time uh beats me i don't know was it 10 or something like that yeah, yeah. but i don't i don't worry about it too much we've got good <laughs> momentum here yeah okay probably because what all of the longhouse was here it's all the, yeah it's all the <laughs> walrus guys, yeah. so yeah. okay uh, uh do you have another here's another here's another image so you can see cattle yeah. in here and this isn't they get bigger than this but this does show how you can kind of stack cattle and then oftentimes in the longer ones you get sort of a tent um to so be able yeah. to have a bit of a structure much like modern ships where you can yeah. take shelter from the rain and the storms and stuff as you're going across the sea yeah so so yeah, the, this... the saga describes that they built a ship but they landed on two different spots. So, like I said, it could be that they detached a boat from it, or they just sailed on two different ships. And there's like a some sort of mistranslation in, in the sagas. So, like I said, don't know. So, if we go to the next slide. All right. Let's uh, and I've got the previous slide. Sorry. Migration, here yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, they sailed in the spring, which is the, the best time to sail, obviously. So true. We do have the best boats. Yeah. That's, that's uh, like, so I said, like I said, it's the, <laughs> it's theoretical. They sailed on Cyprus. We don't know. Uh, yeah. It is said in the Cyprus, they, they took everything. They took all of the possessions, all of the cattle. They took the 10 slaves. Uh, Haraldur Hárfæri, Harald Fairhair, had been, it said that he had been king, it is said explicitly that he had been king for 12 years. Haraldur Hárfæri had been conquered in 12 hours. And it's also, there's a reference in this passage of Genesis. For some reason, Haraldur had been, Haraldur had been conquered in 12 hours. Or have they led it? 6,000 hour for Skupiner. He referenced and he said that Harald had been king for 12 years and and uh, th there had been 6,000 years since the creation of the earth. And from the incarnation of our Lord, 874 years. Yeah, 874 years. So he he marks the date, which is very interesting. He, he So he clearly had access to, to other you know, scholarly, what, what's, what's the calendar called that track the age of the earth according to Genesis? I, th well, who, I think that's the Gregorian calendar. I'm not certain on that. Yeah, it, it, there was a monk who did that. I don't know which one it was. Like who, who, who compared the, the age of the patriarchs and, and uh, made this calculation 6,000 years. So apparently Snorri had access to all of that information mm, yeah. so which is really interesting and nor nordanon's point that they're basically cargo ships the thing that gets missed sometimes in in media about this age is that you see the long ships used for war but you're not going to see things like the canar as often which is something you'd see probably more frequently if you were just going about normal business because you have all these you have a ton of these um you know, whether you call them Vikings or Norsemen, you know, you'd have these guys who a huge part of their job and daily life was trade. So they'd be constantly shipping goods across the North Sea, uh, down to France and back and so forth. Some dude asked if all the men had knowledge of the shipbuilding. Uh, I would probably say not. But uh, these guys were like wealthy guys. These were all of the colonists and explorers were really well off they were from you know good families and 
you know, they, 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 you know, being a Viking, going rating, it was like a pastime for like a semi nobility. You know, it was not for the plebs. So, so the pretty the, profitable too. You know, you find yeah, a yeah. stash of gold or weaponry, some chain mail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so these guys were they probably hired the. I, so I suspect that there was probably some sort of a class of expert shipbuilders you know in scandinavia that or craftsmen that did this all the all of this stuff so yeah um that, I mean, that had to have been the case it, they were so well built so yeah they 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 sailed to so okay next slide yeah we're gonna yes so the Andvei Sulur, uh, apparently Ingolur had two kind of a Sulur, it is, they're not described, some form of totems, like a poles, wooden poles. Uh, we only get a, like a vague description of what they are. Uh, you know, apparently this was some sort of custom or, but you know, I think Ingolur is the only one who who does this and he cast them into the sea and and he he claimed that wherever these poles or totems land i am going to settle that place so you can see this kind of a mythical way of you know mindset you know the gods will decide which place is best probably some sort of a you know a religious mindset most likely I think it's I think it's pretty obvious so and he his first landing was, was in uh but it, it's not where the totem landed he just landed there first it was kind of a it was a plateau right by the shore where he could get a view of the sea and everything and he stayed uh, the winter there. Hjörleifur landed at Hjörleifur, sagði. Uh, Hjörleifur built two cabins. It is to said that. And, and he, he, he made the slaves, you know, plow the field. So I think there's a picture of, of Hjörleifur, sagði, in the next slide, if you... All right, let me get that yeah, so you see Ingolshöfði, this is Ingolshöfði, uh, the next one. Uh, Hjörleifsöfði, you can see that these are almost identical places. So yeah. these are like yeah, these we... miniature plateaus. So this is probably some sort of, you know, frequent you know, first camp for explorers to settle these type of high rising uh, places near the sea, particularly near fjords. Would would that like, well, would, would settle it up on high ground, would that like protect them from like, I, I don't know, like big waves or something? Like, I, also, I'm sure. Yeah, also from just other people. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, talking about all the raiding, I suppose that should have been obvious. Yeah, there, there, there's an island. There's a scribe in, I think, uh, one saga. There's a, there's a dude that makes a last stand in an island like this. This high rising island. It forms kind of a natural fortress. So you can camp there basically for days and to fend off like far larger number of dudes than that are attacking you. So that might be one of the reasons, you know, they, they, they didn't know if there were people, natives or something here before. So you can never be too careful, basically. So hmm. maybe one, once they knew that nobody was here, maybe they settled some other place. So yeah, if you go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so Dufthakur, he was a treacherous bastard. Yeah, that was Strong Island, the last one to correct the last one. Yes, I thought so. Uh, this is that island actually is. It's like a half an hour from from where I live. 
it's in it's in Kvalfjörður, I think. I I've like seen it many times. So <laughs> it is a it is a, a it is like you you live near these places and you encounter them every day. It is really really cool. So uh, have you been to the warm bath on the coast near the island? Yes, I have. Uh, okay, so Dufakur uh, plotted a rebellion. He he was the he was the treacherous guy, you know. He, he was the he he is the villain in the story. Uh, they they apparently brought an ox with them, and and uh, Hjörleifur made all the slaves plow the ox, you know, plow the field with the ox, and Dufthakur apparently got all of the other slaves to on this plan. So he was the uh, mastermind behind this. Uh, Dufthakur, the, the way he he did it. I think Hjörleifur had, uh, he, there were the 10 slaves and there were some, some two or a few other dudes that were not slaves with Hjörleifur, I think. And what they did is that they killed the ox. They, they told everybody, they told Hjörleifur and his men that a bear had attacked the ox. And they went searching for the bear. And then the slaves ambushed them one by one and eventually killed Hjörleifur. And the interesting but, thing too is that, you know, bears, there weren't bears on Iceland, at, but I'll, they didn't I'll know that yeah. at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I wasn't going to ask that. Exactly. So, so it was totally a plausible thing at the yeah, time yeah. for them to believe, oh, crap, maybe there are bears here on this island. That Look at what happened to this ox. Yes, and there are no oxes here as well. <laughs> I think you don't, you don't have any any oxes. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so... Yeah, so the slaves made an ambush, uh, they killed off the men one by one. They stole his boat. So it is described that they took his boat again with a the theory of how they how they colonized. It's not that they took his ship, they took his boat. So it seems to have been like a smaller boat than a knarr. Which would make so, sense, you know, if yeah, you're yeah, yeah. landing sometimes the shores can be rough. You're not gonna wanna you might just leave your ship out. And if you are just landing for the first time, you might want to just take a small boat that's shallower in the water. And if something happens to it, it's not as big of a deal. Well, yeah, it also could have been like, like I said, that they only sailed on one ship and Hjörleifur detached from a smaller boat from that ship. Yeah. Well, and speaking of ships, uh, Drunk, Drongo tells the story, he says, a mysterious toothless man on a moped told me that the Viking ships were only surpassed in speed by modern sailing boats. And, yeah, I could, I could believe that potential. I mean, the, the long ships, modern recreations of long ships have gone up to 15 knots in speed, which is roughly 16 miles an hour. So that's, I mean, that's pretty fast. That's pretty brisk. Yeah, you're kind of I mean, skipping I, across the waves there. I, I think I think like 19th, 17th century ships were much better. Well, yeah, I mean, honest. once you get to the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but th these were like really good for the time. They were peak. The point being well, is that they were fast. Like the, the modern yeah. idea we have of long ships that you see in media is that they're just slowly kind of going. But really, these things were like speeding up. They're like speeding along. And if you had a good wind... And they could get going pretty fast. I mean, the the seas were kind of the highways. Oh, gr green rivers yeah. here. Hey, howdy, uh, welcome. Hello. You got a lot of people in chat today. Fellow, fellow, fellow Dane. So, uh, I think the the best thing about these ships were they could sail in really shallow waters. 
So all, all yeah, and that helped them in the rivers, all the river systems yeah, of yeah. England and France. Uh, I'm going to mention uh, our river system also that Ingolor apparently sailed up on them up later. But yeah, so I'm first going to talk, talk about the rebellion. Uh, so yeah, he took the stole the women of Alibur. So apparently there were women with uh, in the expedition. So like I said, it, this helps, could, it helps with the colonizing part. No, no, no th th this could have been, this could have been, you know, confirming my theory that these were endangered servants bringing their families, not chattel slaves, you know. So yeah. that's, I think that's more likely, you know, they just brought their wives and Yeah, it is not, you know, some, some frille that, that Ingolor or Hjörleifur brought, you know, because Ingolor later, he, ma he was married, you know, to, to Helga. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he, yeah, and then they landed, they sailed all the way to I on islands further to the west. Uh, and these islands are spotted you know, these are, they're always usually always spotted. They were probably spotted all the time by explorers because they're really far south and easy to spot. So they were probably not the first guys to either set foot on them or discover them. So, yes, and Ingolor slaves were looking for the hunters or they back to back to them, uh, you know, switching scenes basically. Uh, he was looking for Hjörleifur also, and they found uh, Ingolor slaves. They found Hjörleifur, and they found Hjörleifur and everyone dead. And then they went and told Ingolor, and Ingolor was obviously pretty pissed off that his slaves could betray him like that and, and you know murder or endangered servants could murder their master like this and this is the, i think the first time when Ingolor speaks in the sagas he looked upon Hjörleifur's dead body uh, i have i have the both the modern icelandic version and the uh, old Norse version and I can you know read both versions and compare them so so with which one would you like to hear first the, the modern Icelandic or the old Norse version of it let's do the modern and then the old Norse yeah. I think that sounds interesting because it's an interesting line um because he, he's you know, standing over the body of his oath brother and he's yeah, yeah. lamenting, you know, it's, it's a powerful line. Yeah. And also I, I have, I have, um, uh, yeah, that more than I think was like, lead the loudest here for gold and drink. A thrailer skilled to a barn of verda. Or see a swag of querium verda at a year with blota. So, this is uh, this is a modern Icelandic dialect and you know pronunciation. I think uh, this is how I would speculation of how old Norse sounded. It was probably not that different, so it probably sounded like this: "Lítið lagðist hér fyrir góðan drink." Er þræla skildu at bana verða og sé ek svá hverjum verða ef eigi vill blóta. This is probably how it was also pronounced. Well, they sound quite similar to me. They, they sound very similar. Uh, uh, if, you, if you hear any, any self-proclaimed experts who, who claim that they can reconstruct Old Norse without speaking Icelandic, uh, don't listen to them because the, uh, you, you see these, uh, how spelling is different. For example, 
Yeah. Uh, uh, you can see we don't have UR. We have after a noun. Go on to make a or for example, we have like um, Trenkur, Trenkur, you know, we have this, you know, R instead of U R. It is really un mm. un really rare in language to add language tend to get shorter, you know, as the age, yeah. they tend to, you know, simplify. You simplify. Yeah. So, so an older language that has fewer letters probably didn't mean that, that, that the letter that the sounded different. It probably sounded the same, but they added the, 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 the sound letter later. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the, the difference is, you know, loudest the cow. So modern Icelandic loudest, old Norse loudisk, because the, the K is a, a clear, uh, you know, it's 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 a totally different letter. It, it, it states a totally different sound. So I think I'm pretty sure that word sounded different. And I, yeah. I think old, old Norse sounded a bit, you know, a bit more harsh, you know, a bit more uh, at, at times, so like a like a bit less smooth, you know, more more kind of a leated lagdisk here for your golden drink instead of leated lagdisk here for your golden drink. Er thrailar skildu at bana verða. Get like er er thrailar skildu at bana er thrailar skildu af bana verða. So, like I said, there are many theories of how it might have sounded, but I think it sounded really similar, if not exactly the same with subtle differences. You know, but because th this is the literal, you know, from the, the, the old Norse version, this is the literal lettering in the sarcas. This is well, what, what it says, you know. <laughs> So, okay, if you go to the, yeah, and Inkular Kjörlur, um, in, uh, yeah, the, the line, it means, it, it, I forgot to translate it. Uh, it means, uh, it means such a shame that the, his slave should kill him. Uh, for such is the fate of a man who refuses to worship the gods. I think the, the line means something like this. So it's basically saying that this is the fate of, this is a punishment from a god, the fate of the faithless, the fate of men who do not trust the gods. It's interesting in the 1898 translation that I was reading this week, their version of it says, Little indeed went here to the undoing of a brave man, and true that slaves should have put him to death, and thus I see it goes with everyone who will do no sacrifice. Yeah, yeah that, that, is you... a, that, that is a good good translation. Uh, okay. I think that, that is pretty spot on. And does I... that include the... Because the interesting thing that stands out to me, I mean, not only is it like, well... You know, this is kind of what happens when you don't sacrifice to the gods. This fate befalls you. But also, there is this lament that, you know, you have this brave man here who was killed in an ignoble way. It wasn't a glorious last stand. He was just sort of slaughtered in an unfair, dishonorable duel or dishonorable ambush. Yeah, lead to the like this. It means, you know, be little has fault. Or, or ah, yeah. it's in Iceland, it's like, a petty fate or, or lead the largest, you know, it's a, it's an Icelandic, the old Norse phrase. I, I, I think it's very interesting how this is this guy's first like statement in the sagas. And he's basically saying you should really worship the gods. Otherwise you're going to get murdered by your slaves. I mean, they, they were believers in fate and like the fate and, and, uh, 
and predestination that was, I think, really strong thing in Norse society. Like, if you look, look at the sagas. Yeah. So, it is interesting because, you know, they're, they're fated by the Norns to die at a certain time in a certain way. But at the same time, there is still also this element of like, well, you were, you were foolish in not honoring the gods with sacrifice. Therefore, your decisions also led to this. So it's, it seems, at least to the modern ear, seems like that might be contradictory. But, I mean, you see that as well with people today who, in certain Christian traditions, believe in predestination, but then nonetheless uh, act in a way that they're still using their will yeah. and choices. It is, it, it is not absolute predestination. It is like a path set yeah. out for you, and then you can choose to act or not act in a certain situation. So you see uh, like an uh, like a example of two, you know, blood brothers who, you know, go down the same road, but their fates end up differently. You know, one dies, you know, a disgraceful death and the other one prospers and leaves many high profile descendants. He is successful. He becomes a legend. Hmm. It's kinda, yeah, yeah. So it's one is cursed, the other one is not. Apparently, that seems to be the motive here. So, but Ingolor had Hjörleifur buried with proper rights. Apparently, he he still, you know, he still honored the gods, and obviously he wanted vengeance. You know, he he, he wanted to hunt these bastards down and. And, and murder them. So if you go to the go to the next slide, so so yeah, Ingolor probably himself spotted these islands, uh, and you know he probably got the idea. You know you can fortify an island much better than the mainland, and also you couldn't probably get far. You know. This Duf, like, who probably wasn't an expert navigator, and this island seemed to have been the best place to to flee to, because this is like a this is like a cluster of islands. Uh, this is a this is a one is relatively big. You can make a living. There is a huge town there now, but I, yeah, I might go into that later. Uh, yeah, we've had, got the photos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Photo of it. Yeah, they, they they headed to the uh, yeah, island to the west. Uh, they found the slaves, which is a landmark today called Aedith, which means uh, kind of a wasteland. I think the Aedith, it is a black beach by the sea. Uh, they, they were doing something, apparently. Yeah, I for also forgot to mention, um, if you go on the, in the slaves, in, in, in when they were settling Hjörleifs, Hjörleifs slaves. It is mentioned that they uh, they made a some sort of wheat or, or, a, or a bread and that was a the Gaelic word for bread described in the sagas. So it's, it's like another confirm, confirmation that few of these, at least one of them, was scales. And then the bread got moldy and they had to throw it off, you know, overboard. You now into the sea. say, hey, we have this brilliant idea for this new dish. And then yeah, it proceeds yeah. to get moldy right away and they have to throw it out. It, it, was, it, was, it was like a Gaelic name for wheat named in the sarcas. I can't remember what what exactly was a bacon minthak minthak uh minthak is a min i think it's a gaelish for wheat minthak it's uh, i think means bread or something in gaelic and it described they make they made minthak when the rain came in uh it got bad they threw it overboard and the uh, bread drifted onto uh, an airy like a miniature peninsula and that today is called minthak's airy yeah that's so funny to me how you know it 
in the starting period that jumped out to me when I was reading that. I was like, really? They named, they're like, all right, we're going to name this whole area after this, like, funny incident that happened where this bread went, or this wheat went bad, this wheat dish. And we threw it overboard, it landed on the shore, we're like, oh yeah, we'll name it after that. Yeah, it's really, really random names. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't give a shit about the names. <laughs> Seems to be... Well, it's not the worst like, way to get a name. Like It's like a, like a bread, like a multi-bread drifting to to a, like a miniature peninsula. <laughs> it could have been named later, though, by, by you know... Mm later Icelanders, you know, from maybe the Middle Ages that read the sagas, you know, something like that. We don't know if they themselves named it. Things are more significant, I yeah. guess, when when they're the first people there. So if you do any dumb thing and you're the first person to do that dumb thing, then then that, that gets written down. Well, yeah. It, it, it it seems to match the same like nickname convention like like uh the guy who found the cool sword being named sword you know yeah yeah exactly yeah the peninsula with the moldy bread gets named moldy bread M multi bread peninsula uh, bread peninsula <laughs> so it's a really holy site probably so uh, yes every and year every year hundreds of icelanders Make the trek down there to leave their own moldy bread. Need to make a, 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 a I need to make a pilgrimage to the moldy bread peninsula. You need to <laughs> sacrifice your moldy bread so that it, so that the gods don't smite you. Yeah, don't exactly. Get betrayed by your slaves. Yes. Modern Icelanders take that deadly serious. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so Inkolur he he sailed and he killed them all. Obviously. Uh. And some of them fled to to like a nearby like a like a rocks so that were like not a part of the island like a rocks from out of the sea you know swam across you know the sea and and, and climbed onto these rocks and you know Ingolf just killed them nonetheless they died on these rocks so you know if he had maybe a spear or an arrow or like how did he kill them all of them like 10 guys yeah. you know <laughs> like did he do you would it think they'd be able to team up <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah. take him down but it sort of acts as this almost vengeful spirit coming to haunt them for their actions i just wonder like did Inkler he had two slaves with him two lawyer slaves and um did he maybe have more guys with him like a like a like a bodyguards or something. So he well, he was definitely well armed. He he definitely probably had a spear, a sword, sidearm, and and a bow. But the the slaves didn't. You know they maybe had a they, they took Hjörleifur's weapon definitely. So but the rest probably only had like sticks and knives. So I mean who knows? In in the translation I have it says they were at meat. When Ingolf came upon them, they fled, terror struck, each in his own way. Ingolf slew them all. Yeah, yeah, that's probably. They, he, they weren't all at the Aedith, I think. I think few, there's maybe few of them, you know, they were more scattered around the island. What? But he maybe what? hunted them down one by one, so, yeah. In in this time period, was it a was it a common thing to like train your slaves for combat, or was that just un, was that not common? But like, like I said, these probably weren't slaves. These were oh yeah, yeah, yeah. just endangered yeah. servants. You know the guys in debt. You know guys who were free men who were you know had to serve Ingolf or Hjörleifur for free. To gain their free to pay off their debt it's most likely some that kind of scenario so these guys probably knew how to fight i would guess okay. or these were some farmers maybe low class guys or you know lower class maybe maybe they didn't know how to fight as well or they weren't as well equipped but like i said yeah. I, we don't know which is i think part of what makes this seem to be such a heinous betrayal to the to the view of of ingolfer 
because these aren't slaves in the way that we think of slaves today. They're more like indentured servants. So they, you know, to expect this sort of treachery is, you know, not something they would be anticipating. Yeah, yeah. And uh, do you Thakur, he fled to a particular rock, which is today called Du score. It's kind of a cliff where he died, apparently. Uh, Ingolu named the, the islands uh, Westman Eyjar, which means Westman Island. Uh, the word Westman, which is, means men of the West. Some say it is the Old Norse word for Gales or Celts. Others, hang on. Oh, we've lost him. Uh, sorry, 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 he's died. Yeah, yeah, sorry, it's I'm over. Back. <laughs> I'm back, sorry, sorry. Yes, uh, others say that uh, Westman means just simply people who live in a British Isles. So it's kind of a debate about it. We just, we don't know. So, you know, there's a kind of a, you know, Westman, it just means men in the West and uh, Norwegians refer to as Östmen, you know, men to the East. Um, there was a settler that was named Westmother probably a nickname, but he was not a Celt. So I, I think my theory is that these guys, Westmen was just a term for anyone who lived in the Isles. You know, because we have the word Irish in the sagas, Irar. You know, so... Uh, if you go to the next slide. Here we go. We've not a, got a nice photo of how it looks today. Uh, uh, British Isles. Thi yes, this is a... Uh, by the way, can you hear me? Or... Yep. yep. Yeah, okay. okay. Th this is... That's my name today. Uh, this is a really unique place in Iceland. Uh, there's a kind of pretty big city there. Mostly sailors who live there. Uh, this is a isolated community. It has its unique culture and way of thinking. Uh, they kind of view themselves as their own thing. Uh, I have a lot of relatives that live there. And once a year, there's like a a festival that is held. It is called Thjóðhátir, a national festival where like all of the country uh, goes and, you know, gets shit-faced in the valley. And there's like these famous musicians that hold concerts during that time. It's a special event, basically. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> intense and stuff. So, yeah, that's that's one interesting. Yeah, so if we go to the to the next slide, this is Aedith. This is the the land. Aedith. Yeah, where the slaves were killed. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Well, yeah. actually, I I have a quick question about the previous uh, the the festival. Like, what was the reason for the festival? Like historically. <laughs> I have no idea. Just to, okay, okay, okay. Just the excuse to get drunk. I mean, perfectly uh, good reason for a festival. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of festivals right there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, every other guy there, you know, is a is a has his own moonshine factory in his basement, and <laughs> and, and uh, you know, these are mostly sailors, and you know, and guys related to the to the fishing industry but they pretty well off guys this is not a poor place by any means uh there was a how much of iceland's industry is fishing 
are pretty big. It was one of the main industries before tourism. Well, I mean, it's an island. I'd be I'd be disappointed if it wasn't. <laughs> to be honest, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was an eruption in the Westman Island in I think in the nineteen seventies. All oh, of the island, yeah. yeah, yeah. All of the Is... island had had to flee. Where was the eruption in two thousand ten? AFL Okay. Yeah. And now there's a there's an eruption like I think a year ago in Gel Geltingness, I can't. Geltingatalis. It's in the It is kind of a weird it is a weird thing to think though. If you if you are living in Iceland, that at any time, the ground beneath your feet might just explode in fire and lava. Exactly, exactly. So next slide. Uh, so Inkolu returned to Hjörle, so then. Uh He stayed during the winter, and he continued his quest for the totems. Uh, he stayed under a mountain during the third winter. So he was here apparently three winters. And he raised another hat onto the mountain. Uh, this mountain is called Ingolsfjall. It's in, a, it's in the southern quarters of Iceland. Uh, this is a kind of a unique mountain. There's a river that runs really close to the mountain. Uh, which is close to the sea, and he could have sailed up that river. It's called Ölvisá. And I think Egil Skallagrimsson's son also drowned in that river. Hmm. So that's an in interesting landmark there. So, and, and we have no idea where, the, where this hut is, you know. But that, so the legends say, we uh, will currently, it was just a temporary camp. It was not a permanent settlement. There seemed to have been a difference between like a permanent house and like these temporary camp and you know, makeshift shelters. But we will currently, they found a, which was Ingolus slaves, they found the totems in a week during the spring. Uh, the landmark is called Arnar Kvaut, or Arnar, in Old Norse, Arnar Hotel in Icelandic. Uh, this is a landmark near the center in Reykjavik today. Ingolur freed them for their efforts. So another hint that these were endangered servants and not property. Uh, he settled down and named his farmstead Reykjavik which is a, which because of the geothermal, you know, there were a lot of hot springs in the area. Mm. And they, they rose, made smokes. Reykjavik, it means smoke, the week of smoke. Week is like a, a miniature fjord. That's the capital of Iceland today. Oh, okay, yeah. So that's, that's the meaning. Yeah. And have those been, are those hot spring areas are they built around uh do they is it even possible to you probably can't build over or change the location of any of those mm, they were they were probably in a place called Lega they, they are you know they obviously tap used it they, they are in a, i think few of them are in uh it was probably referring to Lega mm. it means it means uh like pool valley and all up till up until like the early 20th century before industrialization there were these open hot springs where women used to go wash their clothes and there was like this you know there was a tradition every woman in Reykjavik went there during sun during, no, during Laugar Dagus the Saturdays that's that's the name of Laugardag, which means Laugardagur. Laugar means uh, a, a hot spring or a pool. Th yeah. That's the name of the day, literally, because of this activity. So that's when they wash their clothes. And and this is a landmark in Reykjavik. 
so there was probably that area and today there's a swimming pool there and 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 a park i think or something so uh, so yeah he continued to explore uh, from Ölvisá to Aksarau. Ölvisá is the river mentioned earlier. Aksarau is in Þingvallir. Uh, so Aksarau means X river. And uh, he, I think he did name, he, Ingolf himself, did name the name Aksarau. Uh, the, the name is derived from another settler called Ketilbjörn Gamli, Ketilbjörn the Old. He was a settler from Mosfell. Uh, he was... He had a settlement in Skálabrekka. And they, they... They they came upon... The reason why they came upon this river, you know, they, they named this river Aksarau is because they... And I countered it all the and uh, while it was frozen. Uh, and they were, you know, they, they started making a like a hole in it, I think to fish or something. And he lost the X in the river. So hence the name. And you know, the X might still be there today. Who knows? X River. It's a legendary, legendary item. <laughs> Going, got going bonus back. perks to it. Yeah, uh, th there's also in, in in this river and the lake that it runs into. There's a unique species of trout, brown trout that can only be found in Iceland, and it grows huge. It it's the biggest brown trout in the world. So if you if you if you're interested in fishing in Thingvallavat, it's a really good fishing spot. Uh, so. And Kartli spoke when this is when the quest was finished. Til ills fóru vi erum góð hérð. Er við skulum byggja útnist þetta. It means uh, you know, through bad we and um, you know to, for ill for good and ill or through bad times we went through good at na areas but here we shall in this nes we shall build a settlement or something like this just a rough translation on top of my head it's probably probably more articulated than ac accurate in 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 your translation well, well thought out this is just straight on top, on top of my head so our conclusion of the of the of the journey and Ingolfur apparently built a cabin in Skálafell, which is, I think, in Reykjavík. So, it is fell means like a miniature mountain. Hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I think I can't exactly. There are few Skálafell. Uh, yeah, it could have been, you know, near Bla Blaufjöll. It's a bit outside of Reykjavík. So apparently he settled there. It's called the Blue Mountains. It's ski, a it's ski resort today. But... And Kartli settled near Ölvisvatn. Which is a lake somewhere. So mm. let's go to the next slide. So here is Ingolfjall. And oh, beautiful, this, yeah. Beside it is just rise up at a steep angle. There are a few turf houses in the area. I was actually myself uh, restoring an old turf house in, 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 uh, in that place. So this is a, and there's also another, like a authentic turf house there. And there's Ölvisá is beside that. There's another river called Sojit. There's where two oh. rivers meet. These are two huge rivers meet and form Ölvisá. And is yeah. there good farmland in that area? Yes, very good. Looks it's like one there's, the, yeah, it looks like there's some farms in the photo. It's one of the most fertile places in Iceland. Ah. 
Yeah. This is a does sulfur. The volcanic ash, does that what's the effect of that on the soil? Um I have no idea, but there's I, I don't think there's much volcanic activity at that particular, but there's a lot of okay. earthquake earthquakes there. Mm. And do you get earthquakes pretty often then? Just yeah, yes. day to day? Yeah, uh, not day to day, but pretty regularly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so if you go to the next slide. Here we go. This is a beautiful painting, by the way. Yeah, very kingly. You can see, I'm assuming that's Ingolfer at the top directing the planting of this post. Mm, this is all like a romantic painting. Yeah, because it, it appears to, yeah. I mean, yeah, but it's, it's a pretty good painting. It's They're, yeah. they're planting the, the, the totems and... Oh, so those are the totems that he cast. Yes. Okay. Apparently. Interesting. So if you go to the go to the next slide. This is Arnar Kvotl or Arnar Hotl. This is uh, us during the uh, Euro finals in, in handball, where we landed the, the second place where everything went nuts. Uh, there were like, I don't know, 10,000 people there or something. This is like a famous spot now in Iceland, ah. like for festivals and concerts. Do you want to explain handball a bit? Yeah, it's it's uh, similar to soccer, but you use your hands instead. <laughs> <laughs> soccer, you but definitely not cheating, you know. Yeah, you don't know what handball is. or. I have not played handball. I've heard. I think I've heard the name, but I don't know anything about it. Well, I I actually have played handball. I... <laughs> oh, it's, it's, okay. It's, enough. I we 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 went it. No, no, no. Sorry, this was not handball. This was sorry, football. It was soccer. What what the fuck? Am oh, I? we landed oh, in we landed football, in second. Soccer, we land, yeah. yeah, we landed in second place. I think in two thousand and ten in handball. This was. I think 2000... that's the opposite. I think for uh, foot football. As they say, is the opposite of hand yeah. handball. Yeah, the, I'm this just, is. I'm just making jokes. Yeah, this is during the soccer. Sorry, the Euro Cup where we we beat England in in soccer. Let's go. All right. That's yes. What I'm talking about. Yeah, we. How, that's we, impressive. Yes. Considering yeah. population difference. Like everything went was went nuts here. Absolutely, it was like uh, holy crap. It was like ten thousand people. Uh, I think we landed in. Was it second place? We lost to France, like a, like a nation of three hundred fifty thousand, <laughs> and and Big Bassa was pretty pissed off, probably back, <laughs> pretty oh, disappointed. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> uh, you, you can just imagine imagine the the atmosphere of of, of North FC back then. <laughs> Man, yeah, but I bet people were pretty ecstatic over here i mean just look at that crowd wow yeah it was uh, it was a good time okay so the next slide so here's an excavation in 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 reykjavik uh they're looking just for settlement farms oh ah, yeah uh, you you see this all over the place this is downtown reykjavik this is near arna kotl if you go to the oh. next slide so when when would they dig would there would this be an empty lot that they're digging in, or if they're demolishing a building, they do they say, "Oh, we might as well just dig here"? Mm, I have no idea. I mean, they might get a license to demolish like an old house, and you know, get a license to dig for a few years before another is built on top, or something like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, just to have all that history buried beneath your feet, right yeah, where yeah. you're walking. They they're finding you know new stuff all the time. So. Oh, I bet. Oh wow! So not another excavation. So it's we'll pretty go, cool. Go to the next. It's a traditional Icelandic wool sweater, by the way. Oh wait, let me see the let me see that sweater. Oh yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, no, yeah, that's classic. It, it, it's classic. You got that kind of more band band yeah. look that goes across the whole the whole top of the body. It's Look's made from a different. It's made from a different wool, I think, than the Norwegian one. 
Okay. It's a bit, yeah. it's a bit more rough. Yeah. It, it's like uh, the Norwegian one looks more like uh, something that fairies would wear, you know. But but the Icelandic one is like more rough, you know. <laughs> so says <laughs> so says the Icelander. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, this is Reykjavik and like Reykjavik has always been like this tiny, basically port village up until, you know, the early 1930s, almost all the way, almost to the, to the forties. The first, it wasn't a proper town until, until the Marshall plan, you know, mm. after, after world war American occupation during world war two, when they started to proper industrialization i i didn't realize the so that you're saying the marshall plan affected reykjavik directly oh yes all of iceland i uh, so how because the marshall plan is all about you know what to do with germany and german deindustrialization yeah after world war ii but well, what really what exactly happened and maybe this is this is probably enough for another stream to cover how the marshall plan affected Iceland, but do you want to just well, elaborate was, a little bit on how how that happened? I mean, or should we save that? It was just you know the army forcefully industrializing us, basically, and making. You say the U.S. the U.S. army or the Icelandic? The the U.S. army, but it's kind of a two way street because we, you know, I'm I'm against industrialization. Obviously, I think we should have remained. The way we were too too much of the old ways were, was destroyed back then but to be honest though we kind of you know got a lot of you kind of got a good deal they built a lot of you built basically gave us a free airport and free roads and mm. a lot of free shit, you know and we didn't have to pay them back basically because they needed to have an outpost here <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we apparently had uh you know a lot of we pretended to have more bargaining power than we actually did <laughs> and they had just said yeah fine sure you know we we give you all this shit you know they've got plenty of stuff to spare <laughs> yeah, we were really really fucking greedy you know <laughs> uh, they, they, this is a whole story unto itself the, the well, most, they, yeah i'm excited they, to dive into that some other time yeah well We'll Ex exported explore. all sorts of machines and stuff. So yeah, next slide. Uh, this is like a probably how a typical settlement house, turf house looked like, uh, like with, without the roof. This is like the only reconstruction I could find. So kind of like a really small, then they evolved into these larger long houses, longer turf houses. And this is one of the it, earlier ones you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The turf force kept evolving. It never stopped yeah. evolving. It became more complex and sophisticated. And would no. you have kept cattle in this at any point to Yes, yes, yes. Okay. To to it is excellent keep, to, to keep. keep heat trapped. You you basically yeah. don't need, I think, any firewood. It's so good at isolating heat. Wow. You, need, you, need, you need a bit of firewood, obviously, but you don't need that much of it, you know. Amazing ingenuity. So next slide. Uh, so in Kul's legacy, yeah, he was obviously the most famous, one of the most famous settlers here. He is, he is a legend. He is the, he's one who, the pioneer who basically founded this place. Is he referred to as the, the father of Iceland? kind of kind of yeah so uh, he is like the like a kind of like the christopher columbus type so he and and he is the first to permanently settle he settled before hrapnaflokki but then hrapnaflokki came because he didn't want to you know be called the pussy and <laughs> and look like an you know a wimp because he chickened out so hrapnaflokki came back because of incolors Inkolo's wife was Hatvig Froda daughter. So she was not Celtic. 
there we have it. Uh, their son was Thorsteinn. Uh, Thorsteinn was an interesting character. He was uh, he was uh, he founded Kalanisting, which is a sort of a precursor to Althingi. And uh, it's sort of like a really remarkable. He, he was obviously one of the like a top guys here. He 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 was a probably a godi, some sort of godi, or a or a. And and his son was a Thorkell Mauni. Now Thorkell was a law speaker, uh, which is a really important position in the Godorf. The Godorf is a it's a it's a different type of it's it's a it's a council in the commonwealth like council of elders and the law speaker is the man who remembers all of the laws so you can imagine so you better remember them right yeah there was one guy who was in charge of mem remembering every single law and then the rest of the council decided you know made new laws settled disputes kept the the you know the the traditions and and so forth, and if you go to the sorry yeah, so if you if you go to the no no sorry previous slide oh previous no no, no next yeah uh, lag so every time every time you know the wonders of modern technology yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's also an interesting description about uh, Thorkell Mauni that I'm going to read here. Hans son var Þorkell Máni Lögsumaður. Er einn heiðuna manna á Íslandi hefðir best verið síðaðir. Which means he was one of the best, most moral and virtuous pagans in Iceland, says in the sagas. And also, hann lét bera sig í sólargeisla í heilsótt sinni og kvál sig á hendi þeim guði er sólina hefði skapað. Að hann hefði, hafði og lifað svo hreinlega sem til kristni menn er best eru síðaðir. It means that he was dying of, of a plague and when he was dying he had his uh, he, I think while he was dying he had this he had been carried into the race of the sun because he wanted to he wanted to you know uh, have his soul or his destiny you know fall into the hands of a god who created the sun and it is said that he lived as purely as any christian man would have which is really interesting yeah, and his son I was curious about that when I was reading that passage. Yes, yeah, so it says the God. Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't. Have, uh, I'm trying to find where it is, but yeah, carries him. Out, the translation I was reading. Yeah, so it's carried him out as he was, as he was dying to. Yeah, essentially give his soul to the God who created the sun. But in the cosmology of the prose Edda. You have, you know, the earth and the skies, which are, are the brains and the, the skull of the giant. So it does make me wonder, um, is his conception of God more, especially at the end, more akin to the Christian God? I mean, had Christianity was known, I believe, at that time, was it not being spread? This, this can be... Uh... Uh, th this can be easily misinterpreted as some by some, you know, e esoterics that cl may claim that this is some sort of sun god or a or a some Thulean elder god that is that he secretly worships or some bullshit like that. Uh, first of all, in Norse mythology, the the sun was female and the moon was male, so. That kind of a, kind of a, you know, gets rid of that. And 
he, I think he's obviously referring to, you know, because Christianity was spreading at the time. And some of the earliest settlers, like they were called of both faiths, they, they worshipped God as a patron along with the pagan gods. So these ideas were, especially he was a learned man as well. So he was obviously familiar with, with the Christianity. And he seems to describe it as a, mon a monotheism in a monotheistic way, not as a some sort of Apollonian god dragging the sun. I mean, the, the, the pagan concept is, you know, literally the sun is being chased by a wolf. That's, that's just, that's literally the pagan view of it. So that's, I, but like I said, we don't know. I have no idea. That's just what it says said in the, and he described yeah. as he, I mean, he it's lived. very poetic though. He lived like a Christian. So he, they are yeah. connected, he's not really at least is connecting it to Christianity. His life and his, you know, view and his theology. So and you do have that in Christianity, the idea that there are these, these pagans who in some sense are perhaps worshiping God without explicitly saying it in that way. Well, yeah, um, there, it, it's it's the belief of at least uh, the Orthodox and many Catholics that like Socrates had many uh, correct views relating to God. He just didn't have all of it. So exactly, and he seemed to be described in a similar manner, like a proto-Christian or some something like that. And then, then if you go on uh, to to the lineage. His son, Thorkell's son, was uh, Thorstein's son was Thorkell Mauni, and Thorkell was a law speaker at Alþingi. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, th 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 no, Thorkell. Sorry, Thorkell had a son called Thormóður, and Thormóður. Sorry, I was talking about Thorkell. No, no, Thorkell earlier. Uh, Thormóður, Thorkellsson, was a allsherjagóði, which means a, like a high-góði, chief-góði. So he was also a, 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 in high position. And it is said that he was a góði during Christianization. So he was one of the guys that decided upon whether Iceland should be Christian or pagan during the times of Thorgeir Ljósvatningagóði which is also really interesting. So if we go to the next, and here's a statue of Ingolur Arnason. Yeah, very epic statue. Yeah, really uh, cool. The, I love the way he's holding his, I mean, his ax is pretty incredible too. It's like, a, I mean, it's much later in its design, but it's pretty, pretty epic. It's just, it is made by a famous artist called, uh, I think, Einar Jonsson. Yeah, I just love the pose, though. I mean, it's very uh, magnificent. He's got his leg up. He's got his arm reaching and wrapping around the axe. The axe is sort of, it's not facing, it's got points. It's got three, or it's got the two points and the blade. And it's not like facing at the island, but it's, it's still Ein, there. It's yeah, he, Einar Jonsson is like a legendary sculptor. He, he is like Iceland's Antonio Breker. He, he is like yeah, heavily so cool. in, in, influenced by by the early 20th century romantic movement. And he studied in Copenhagen. Hmm. And he, he's like considered one of Iceland's you know, artistic geniuses. So he is a 20th century... So he... Was this made in like the fifties or the sixties or something? Uh, or was that when he was active around that time? No, he was born uh, eighteen seventy four. He died oh, in nineteen fifty four. Oh. oh, okay. So, so really like, like, uh, like, uh, like a nineteen hundreds, you know, early, late eighteen hundreds, you know, romanticism. 
It was and you can see the, the dragon motif as it looks at, almost as though he's standing by the dragon head on the prow of a longship. Yeah. yeah. It's very it, cool. It's really epic statue. And you also met the one of Leivur Eriksson, I think. Yeah. By Hallgrimskirkja. So I think... Yeah, no, it does look kind of like an at, an at gear. <laughs> My... <laughs> Uh, uh, Quati, yeah, he, he's, a, he's a friend of mine. Hey, howdy, Quati. Welcome <laughs> to chat. Glad to have you, buddy. Yeah, pole arm is a is a is a art case. It is a speculate. Yeah. It is a speculative weapon that Gunnar Hamundarson apparently used. We have no oh, knowledge okay. of of how it looked like. You know, it could. Apparently, it was some sort of halbert, but but you don't yeah. know. Yeah, because you'd expect, I mean, you'd expect that to be something you'd see in in Italy quite a bit later. But it is, it's a magnificent axe. Yeah, but th- this this specific thing, this is made up speculatively for, like, in you know, artistic by Einar Jonsson, but you know, like a romantic esque. We don't know. And Inkolor is never said to have an outgate. Mm. You know. Yeah. But it's almost more, with a lot of this stuff too, it's like it's kind of fusing of the past and what it would become later in Icelandic history. You see that with a lot of kind of romantic era artwork. It's kind of fusing the past with the different eras in a way that's pretty cool to me. I do kind of like that. As long as people are clear that it's not designed to be a historical snapshot. I do yeah, like a- that kind of fusing of eras. Yeah, a- Einar Jonsson was pretty clear on that. He was a clear romantic and 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 you could see this this could very well be something from a Wagner play or a or a romantic, you know, painting. Oh, you know, yeah. he he was a clear, you know, romantic sculptor, but consciously so, and he was a brilliant one. So this yeah. is like a romantic image of English. It's not historically accurate, but it's you know it's pretty damn good nonetheless. But so. before we get to comments here, I want to just mention this week you guys have got to get stoked because probably by the end of the week I'm going to be dropping finally after all these months of build up, finally dropping the Berserker video. We've got some cool interviews in there. We've got a big name guest. We've got. Some really fun stuff. Adam Dole helped me out with that. A few owners helped me out with that. It's been a huge project. Uh, Nathan Rakesmith, who's in chat, he's helped me out with that big time. So this is going to be, it's going to be a big deal. I'll drop it. Just saying. Just saying. It's going to be kind of a big deal. It's going to be epic. It's going to be very, very cool. So you guys have to get hyped for that because that's going to be dropping really, really soon here. And I'm excited to get that to you guys. But I want to hear what you guys have to say in the comments before we close it out. Uh, I want to know what your thoughts are. And then I'll have to meet up with a friend that I promised I'd be hanging out with later. But I want to hear from you guys. What do you guys think of this? Um, Fjolnir, do you have any kind of closing thoughts on the on the story? Uh, yeah, my take uh, on the story is itself a motive seems to be kind of a, a bit maybe not it might be not Cain and Abel but you know you know you have like two guys one is cursed and the other is not you know something you know you, you see this common motive in in mythology you know, was it like uh so it was like Esau and Jacob or something like one, one leaves many descendants and the other one is like cursed and dies, you know, or, or... so th- th- this seems to be the same motive here, you know, and, and, and because of he's not, he's not, uh, it doesn't respect the gods, you know, mm, yeah, that, that's what I see in this story. That's, that's what I, you know that that's the base motive. You know, Inkul is clearly blessed. You know, he he 
his slaves or his servants are loyal. He finds, you know, fertile, prosperous land and he leaves. He's basically a father of a whole nation, like literally. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. When did arranged marriages decline in Iceland? Uh, I think <laughs> I would probably just say after, you know, <laughs> Americanization, basically. Oh, that uh, that recent. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we literally lived like before, like in in before nineteen forty five, we literally lived like the eighteen hundreds, like in America, like time was literally just a different era, like socially and and culturally and everything. That's weird to think about. So it's, it's like a like a place forgotten by time. It's like, it's like a nation of, of Amish, basically. Like no no technology, no uh, industrialization, nothing basically. Just it's a, a, a society of agrarian farmers. He's saying Iceland gave women the vote before you were Americanized. Yeah, that, yes, that, that the case? that's true, but that's. Um, that's because of it was not like a like this uh, this American version of 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 feminism. It was from a different. It was more like a there was also you know communists here before Americanization. It was like a communist movement and all this romantic nationalistic movement. But but like I said, there was also almost nothing here. You know, it was. Um, it was kind of us LARPing with these foreign ideologies that have actually, you know, the Icelandic communists were still very patriotic. Hmm. And I, I don't know that much about why the women got the vote. I have to look into that better. Uh, but it was not that long before the Americanization. So, so yeah. Um, and another motive I see is, you know, you have this explorer motive in, in all of the sagas. You have, you know, the archetype of the explorer seems to be very heavily emphasized many times you know exploration so yeah and literally all these people who are descended from these extreme risk takers it's not a it's not a casual thing to totally uproot yourself take what you own and set out into practically the unknown on a dangerous voyage where you could drown at sea very easily. It is also possible, like, why we settled Iceland. Um, there is, like I mentioned earlier in the video, there is a very plausible theory that uh, the guys, you know, we obviously have a reason why these guys settled. It's given a reason, like, he lost his land because of this blood feud. But why? Why did we have like the Gordor and not just Jarls like the Norwegians did or a king? Mm. Mm -hmm. So, which is like an interesting question. Like, was there a this you know learned you know circle of or, or network of intellectuals that was opposing the king? You know the this you know crack brain you know king that was imitating. Charlemagne basically by uniting Norway and, and they were like fleeing to you know to, they wanted to maintain a commonwealth or a or different form of government basically what was that the reason I mean, it could have been yeah in Nordenon comments that and I think he's referring to would this have been the 20th century Iceland was Danish at the time perhaps you're yes yes uh, yes before American Colonization. We got our independent <laughs> independence 
as a part of basically the Marshall Plan, you know, 1945. <laughs> it's Trading just, one it's, master for another. Yeah, this is like a quote unquote independence. Yes. So, well, uh, <laughs> on on that note, um, we'll have to wrap it up here for today. Unfortunately, I've got a I've got some friends I promised I'd meet up with, but I'm very excited for next week's episode. It's still a little bit up in there what we'll be covering specifically. We want to dive a lot into mythology. You know, what are some of the creatures of mythology and local folklore? Um, there's some really cool stuff. Fjolnir has some pretty cool insights on like local folk myths and creatures stuff so we might we might drop into that nordenon says he was referring to the women's vote thing so okay yeah you might also see, just see. take you might also just cover another uh saga another settler yeah so I'm, I'm thinking i'm thinking like we should we should finish at least the major settlers and, and then maybe move on to a different era Definitely. And then we've got the Christianization of Iceland to look forward to. So that's going to be a really interesting one. Yeah. And well, the whole, whole Sturlunga saga also, which is like a medieval yeah. period. It's a lesser known, lesser known saga. Most foreigners don't, are not, are not familiar with. Well, thanks for joining us, Quadi. Yeah. Much, much appreciated. Feel free to stop by anytime. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, too. There's so much, especially for the English-speaking world, we don't really have a lot of knowledge of a great amount of history in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia, in Iceland, between roughly 11, or 1200 to 1900. So there's kind of this big black hole that we'll be excited to go through. We'll get on additional guests. Fjolnir will present more. It's going to be a lot of fun. But, um, hey, thanks, DTTW. Glad to have you here as well. Um, yeah, we've got, I mean, what makes this so much fun is we've got the great folks in the chat keeping things going, adding to the spice. And, okay. yeah, I just want to thank Adam, want to thank Fjolnir, yeah. and catch you all on the next one. See ya.